Okay, welcome back. Hi, it's uh, El Salvador Then came here. Nice to see you. Okay, today's uh, June 26. Our sermon title is Ascension, Ascension Sunday, because we believe not in funerals and death, but we believe ascending into the kingdom of heaven after we pass away. So I thought I'd share with you some of uh, some of the words. Uh, from the Bible and other evidence of life after death. I heard this and I thought this is really important, the power of not yet. And that is a difference between telling your children you can't do it as opposed to you haven't, you're not able to do it yet. It's a giant difference. And they, they did a study on it that pe when, when kids are told, when they try to do a math problem and they can't get that math problem right and they're told you can't do it or you didn't do it, they become discouraged and think, oh, I can't do math. But they had uh, other teachers who, whenever they couldn't do it, they said, oh, you haven't learned how to do that yet. We're going to show you how to do it. Then they would go on and le actually learn how to do it and do much better at mathematics than in the past. So there's two, just two different ways of looking at life. I, that is, I can't do it, or I didn't do it, or I won't do it, as opposed to I simply haven't done it yet. I thought that would be, I think that would be really good for us to understand. Say, I haven't been able to do it yet. And that will help us in our, in our life of faith. Okay, so this is from the Divine Principle book, 73 edition, which I like to read. I know there's a one-hour lecture series, which is okay, but I like to read the 73 edition because it's just more thorough. So this is chapter 5 on resurrection, which always gives me inspiration and hope for the future. It says, God created man to grow old and turn to dust. That's how God created you to be. That's why your organs begin to fail as you get older. Some people get balder. Some people get fatter, etc., etc. You can name the, your symptom. This would occur even if man had not fallen. Therefore, when Adam died at the biblical age of 930 and turned to dust, this was not the death which was caused by the fall. It's natural to return back to dust because if we didn't, then after a while the earth would fill up and then you couldn't have any more kids because you'd have 200 billion people on the earth. Well, then you'd run out of space. You'd run out of earth. So God made it so we would continually re recycle onto the earth with new people and then the rest of the people would live in the spirit world and it's not much a better place. So we think this earth is just a, a temporary place where you go from zero to 100 and then at 100, you go to the next level of life, which is the spirit world. According to the principle of creation, our flesh is like clothes to our spirit. When you wear clothes, your clothes are not your body. Your body is your body. Right? Uh, and it is natural for us to discard our flesh when it is old and exhausted, just like we would discard worn out and old clothing. Right? So it's not your body that's most important. It's your spirit. Then our spirit man goes to the invisible world to live there forever. There is no single material being that can perpetuate its physical life forever. Can't be done. All things live, die, and then replaced by what? Younger versions of yourself. Right? Even redwood trees live to be 3,000 years old, but during that time they're, they're giving, well, I guess you can say giving birth, but fertilizing new seeds that are growing up next to them, and when they finally get old, their children will repopulate the forested area. Make sense? Same with us. I'm getting older. I know it's hard to believe, but I'm getting older, and I'll be replaced by baby Lucia and Leo and uh, other, other children. So, let's see. Where was I? Mm, not, then our spirit man goes to the invisible world to live there forever. There is no single material being that can perpetuate its physical life. Man is no exception to this principle of creation. The human body cannot live forever. Okay. Genesis 3.19. So let's read about this. This is very important. 3.19 is the curse upon human beings on earth. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Because of the fall of man, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. That means we have to work hard to get bread. Right? Till you until you return to the ground. Now this is really important to me, right? For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, 
and to dust you shall return. So, but let me, let me make this point clear. The curse is until you return to the ground. After that, there's no more curse. Let me keep reading to you. Okay. Divine Principle 73. Fallen men are strongly attached to their physical life on earth because due to the fall, they become ignorant of the fact that they have been created to go to live eternally in a beautiful, invisible world after discarding flesh. Right? We don't know. We don't even know who God is, much less uh, how nice heaven is or spirit world is. We don't know those kinds of things. We're learning and getting better at it. Our physical life on earth and our spiritual life in the invisible world may be compared to phases of a caterpillar and butterfly. If an ugly caterpillar living in the soil had consciousness, he would also be reluctant to die from attachment to his life under the earth, just as a man is attached to his physical life on earth, right? If a caterpillar is going to eventually get into a cocoon and turn to a beautiful butterfly, no longer an ugly caterpillar. This is because a caterpillar does not know, sorry, there is another new world after his death where he can enjoy fragrant flowers and eat sweet honey. Right? He, on the ground, he's just eating old roots and dead things and stuff like that. Green leaves, which are bitter, if you've tried it. Anyhow, so that's better. On the other hand, if you have, this means me, you have a lot of guilt over evil doing on earth, you may be terrified of going to the spirit world because you do know where you're going to go there. This is really important. In order to live a heavenly life on earth is how you get to a heavenly place in the spirit world. So let's keep going. The relationship between an earthly man and a spirit man is similar to that between a caterpillar and a butterfly. If man had not fallen, he would have known that discarding his flesh does not mean eternal separation from his loved ones, because the earthly men were created to communicate freely with spirit men. Right, now that's still a struggle for us. For me, I don't want to die. I'm changing my diet, I'm living healthier, I'm walking an hour every day. You know why? Because I want to take care of my grandkids. I can't imagine not being with my grandkids anymore. I'll do anything. I'll, I'll eat healthy. If I, that's what it takes to uh, take care of my grandkids. No cake. <laughs> or at least very little cake. <laughs> I'm not a masochist after all. But. See, we don't know. The, tr the point about communicating with spirit world is will we be different? First generation who gave their lives to live with God. Second generation is born out of a sinless relationship. Third generation, which is a third generation being born out of a sinless relationship. Will our ability to communicate from spirit world be different than our grandparents who live utterly under the curse? who live under, utterly under the curse of the fall of man. So the trouble is we can't see. The trouble is we're, we're sort of like in the middle of the book. We don't know yet what's going to happen by the final chapter. And that's, uh, that could cause us to lose faith. So someday we'll we be able to communicate freely with spirit men just as we do among ourselves. When we go to picnics, not only will we be there, but we'll see Grandma and Grandpa and Uncle Ben and weird Uncle Harry and Aunt Martha. We'll be able to see and talk to them too. Besides, if men knew what a beautiful and happy place the spirit world is, they would look forward to the day of departure from this world into the next. That makes sense, right? Jesus said that. My, I, in uh, my father's house are many rooms. Don't worry, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And it's going to be great. You're going to love it there. I hope so. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. Okay, this is really important. This is St. Paul saying, In my mind, I delight in the law of God. Right? No, that's not true. In whom in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of the unbelieving that the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should not dawn upon them. So what this is saying is that the world we live in today, Satan is the God of this world. And we live under the curse of the God of this world. Okay? But, so Satan is the God of this world, but Satan is not the God of the next world we'll live in. 
And we have to understand that. There's no curse in the next world we live in. Right now we're fighting with our bodies, let's see. There's no curse there, right? Romans 73, but I see another law in my members warning against the law of my mind and bring me into captivity to the law of sin, which is my members, my body, my physical body, causes us to be greedy, to want to drink alcohol, to try to eat in excess, to be lustful, to be lazy, to do all these kinds of things, right? That's our body fighting with the law of our mind. To be selfish, to be afraid, to preach, to do all these things. That's our body fighting with the law of our mind, but when our body turns to dust, our spirit will no longer be under the curse. Our spirit will be able to go to God's realm where God is totally sovereign. And I know it's almost impossible to imagine that, where God is the king. And there's no evil people to tempt you or tempt your body or do any of those things. You can live in true love with God as God's child, with all brothers and sisters as God's children. This is what Reverend Moon always talks about, that this is going to be the life we lead, so let's just prepare for that. Okay. Okay, this is Reverend Moon's words in 2010, and these are some of my favorite words that Father taught us. God's kingdom of Chungul Guk in Korea. We can easily see that each person's life goes through three stages. First stage, everyone is conceived through the grace of God and the love of his or her parents. God knew who you were before you were born. And God worked so that you would be born. And you don't have to worry about that. Two, so the first stage of life is a long yet short nine months, you know, ten lunar months or nine solar months, spent in the mother's womb. No one is exempt from this. Whether we are conscious of it or not at the time, all of us, without exception, spend nine months in our mother's womb. Even though a woman's womb is smaller than some rice cookers, from the perspective of a fetus, it is larger than the entire universe. Right? Babies, but no, babies inside the womb feel everything their mother feels. So that's why husbands have to love their wives, especially during pregnancy. When wives feel loved by their husbands during pregnancy, then the baby feels loved by their father in pregnancy. That's so important. So, and then he continues. What about our birth into the second stage of our lives, which occurs on earth? How could we find words adequate to describe the struggle of a newborn baby as it is faced with a completely unfamiliar new world, right? When babies are born, they cry. Their body's changing over from, from actually living on the blood of their mother to actually breathing air. It's a complete dramatic uh, change and shock for the body to now begin to breathe air. They used to hit you. Remember that in the old movies? They used to slap you on the buttocks. And then you, a baby would breathe and then cry and breathe. Now they rub you, by the way. All my kids were rubbed. So, uh, and then I would get to hold them and then your wife gets to hold them. Completely different atmosphere than the old days. Right? But still, it's a, a, a dramatic experience to be born. It's a traumatic experience to be born. The first cry of a newborn as it experiences a large and wide world that it finds upon coming out of the womb is a blessing and celebration of a new time and space that promises a 100-year future. If you're lucky. Most people don't get 100 years. But you're promised that. When a baby's born, don't we all celebrate? Do we all think, oh no, not another kid. We don't think that. We celebrate and have a birthday party and have balloons and a gender reveal. We're still legal to have gender reveals now. So we still have gender reveals and we have parties and we all pray. We pray for 40 days and we pray for this kid and everybody holds a kid and kisses the kid and goo goo ga ga and loves the kid, right? That's our birth on earth. That's how it's supposed to be our birth on earth. Today we are all blessed to be living in the second stage of our lives. Although 100 years is much longer than the nine months we spend in the womb, please do not forget that there is still a course we must follow to a higher end. And that's what Jesus said. When you're on earth, what we have to do is build for ourselves treasures in heaven. And what is a treasure in heaven? It's our love lives on earth. Especially sacrificial love that you express on earth becomes treasure, gold, diamonds in the kingdom of heaven when you go to the spirit world. Although we have all forgotten the standard of consciousness that we possess in our mother's womb, 
and we are now enjoying our lives fully in this big wide world, this is merely preparation for the final stage of our lives, which is eternal life, which is going to be great. Just like a baby in the womb cannot imagine a life in the, in the earthly world, right? Baby in the womb is getting all food, all nutrition from the mother's umbilical cord. But when we're here, you could eat anything you want, right? You don't just have to drink blood from your mother's umbilical cord, <laughs> right? You can eat cake. You can eat bacon. You can eat all delicious things that you like to eat, fresh fruits, all kinds of things. So life on earth after birth is much better than life in the womb, isn't it? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. The third stage occurs in the world of eternal life, which we can enter by reaching perfection. This is the spiritual world. It is a world that cannot be imagined by people descended from the fall. That's why we're not descended from the fall. We're descended from the blessing of marriage by Jesus Christ and our true parents. It, it, it is a world in which we transcend time and space. Just as the baby in the mother's womb cannot imagine life on earth, we as people living and breathing air in this earthly world cannot easily understand the spirit world where we will be reborn in our spiritual bodies living and breathing true love. Do you know why? Because there's no curse in the spirit world. If we live in a world of God's total sovereignty where there's no more evil, no more Satan, no more temptations, no more fallen nature, no wrestling with your body, just true love. As people face death, they may shake in fear and feel terrified if they do not understand the true meaning of death. Although human history has continued for more than 6,000 years, no one has clearly taught the truth regarding death. Now in the last days of history, I have been able to reveal this truth, this heavenly secret, as a true parent of all humankind. And I think that's wonderful truth. And I believe this truth myself. By the way, you know, I'm spiritually somewhat open. I've met Jesus. Jesus didn't give me a tour of the spirit world, but he let me glimpse it. And I thought, that's, this is going to be great. So don't worry. The point is, though, you have to learn to love. That's the secret. If you don't learn to love and love sacrificially somebody else, then you will go to middle realms of spirit world, which are still pretty good, but they're not that great. So here's what Reverend Moon says. Ladies and gentlemen, the word death is sacred. Shouldn't be scary. The word death is sacred is not a synonym for, synonym for sadness and suffering. Just like a birth of a baby is not a synonym for misery, is a point of happiness. Great! A new grandchild. I have created the term sungwa, which means ascension to explain the true significance of death. That's correct. It is a time for those of us remaining on earth to send off the departed with joy and happiness. Right? After Jesus ascended, what did it say the apostles did? They were all joyful. They all left the place where Jesus said and were all joyful and happy. Yay, they weren't thinking, oh no, Jesus is dead now. We're all, but they were very joyful and happy. It's an incredible experience. It should be a time for great celebration. We should be shedding tears of joy instead of tears of sadness. That is the significance of the sacred and noble Sungwa ceremony. It is a first step towards enjoying eternal life in God's embrace. The moment of death should be a time of greater excitement than that of a newlywed bride going to her groom's home for the first time. I guess for the husband too. Anyhow. So I thought, so for us, most of us believe in the spirit world. But I thought I would also record many, much more evidence that what True Father says is in fact correct. Right? Because many skeptical people think, well, there's not really a spirit world. Will it, will it be good? So here's a website you can visit called Scientific Evidence of the Afterlife. Scientific evidence of people who've had a near-death experience come back and tell us about it. But there's proof for that. So let me explain some of these things. There is a mountain of scientific evidence, evidence suggestive of consciousness surviving bodily death, which includes, one, verified out-of-the-body perception suggestive of mind-body dualism. Remember two weeks ago I talked about mind-body dualism? That certain scientists believe our mind is separate from our brain. We have a brain, but that's not us. We don't live in our brain is where our radio room is, but we're different. Our consciousness is different. So, 
and I'll read some of these to you. When people have an out-of-body experience and they float, they see things that otherwise they could not know was taking place, except that they were separate from their body. Two, uh, near-death uh, experience perception of people who were born blind now can see things in their spiritual body. Two, the vivid remaining NDE memories which are not possible with brain anomalies. So when the brain is completely shut down to do due to uh, anesthesia or it's dead. Some people are actually made dead so that they could do brain surgery or heart surgery and things like that. But their brain, somehow their mind is still recording events. I'll read some to you. The dramatic after effects resulting from NEDs which do not occur with brain anomalies. For example, what about atheists who have a near-death experience and see God in their spiritual body? Do they remain atheists? Usually, no, they don't. They become religious people. I'll read some of those uh, stories. Unbiased young children having the same experience as adults, you, know, you could say, well, I read about near-death experience, I was in a coma, and when I wake up, I decided to tell you a story based on what I read about near-death experience. But babies and little kids can't know that information, right? They can't read books yet. Nevertheless, they have the same meanings of uh, ancestors and grandpa and grandma, people who love them and welcome them, but tell me how to go back to Earth for now. Scientific discoveries resulting from NDEs. Actually, there's been cases, I won't read it because it's a really long case, of a person who passed away, saw this kind of uh, knot that explained something about uh, atomic structure, came back and reported it, and physicists heard it and said, oh, that's the answer. We've been looking for this answer for 20 years, and this person who had a ex spiritual experience found the answer. But I won't read that one to you. Verified versions of the future given to experiencers in the, uh, their absolute conviction of their near-death experience being a real afterlife experience, plus many supporting fields of discovery, such as remote viewing and, uh, diff and different things, quantum physics, they say, stuff like that. So, this is a person People see verified events while out of the body. This is by Kevin Williams. Scientific method. How do we know what science is? Science is something scientific that we may have evidence of, but we can't actually see it or touch it, right? We can't repeat it. For example, we all believe that the sun is made of hydrogen, right? What, do you know why we believe that? You know why we believe, how do they know? It's, they can't go there and take a dip out of the sun. And, oh yeah, this is hydrogen. It's a lighter than air. How do they know it's the sun's made of hydrogen? Of what? The results are, oh, sorry, I'll stop doing this. Uh, a, a, a scientist invented what's called a, a spectrochromatograph. Have you ever heard of that, a spectrochromatograph? And what it is, it measures light waves based on understanding what light does when it passes through certain things. So if you're a machinist like me and we want to know, if somebody gives us a piece of metal, we want to know what it is, we use a spectrochromatograph and what we do is we burn part of it, we look at the gas and the spectrochromatograph can tell us, oh there's copper in there, there's steel, there's iron, there's carbon, there's 2% hydrogen, things like that. So they use a spectrochromatograph to look at the sun and they look at through the light passing through the the gas in the sun, and they say, oh, that's the same as on Earth, it's hydrogen. That's how they know, right? But they can't prove it, except there's evidence that the sun is made of hydrogen. Okay? So, so same thing with dinosaurs. How do we know dinosaurs exist? No one's ever seen a dinosaur. But there's evidence that dinosaurs exist. We find giant bones in the ground and fossils. By the way, they're not bones. They're stone images of bones that used to exist. That's how we know. So we find evidence, and therefore we believe there's dinosaurs. It's the same with out-of-the-body experiences. You can't prove it. You can't put a spirit in a bottle and show it to people and say, see, here's a spirit. You can't do that. But there is evidence. So scientific method requires all phenomena to be re reproducible, provide ver veridical detail that is that can't be explained away, that are verified, and undergo rigorous tests to rule out all the known alternative explanations for theory to be proven as scientific fact. However, good scientific evidence for survival can be found in other realms of research, such as quantum physics, cautious studies, remote viewing, and to, not to mention the mountain circumstantial evidence. So here's some of the circumstantial evidence that you have a spirit that will not die 
when your body turns to dust. Example number one. An elderly woman had been blind since childhood. But during her NDE, the woman had regained her sight, so she was floating and watching the operation, and she was able to accurately describe the instruments and techniques used during the resuscitation of her body. So she could see, oh, there was a clamp, there was a this, there was a, a knife. She can't hear that, especially she was under anesthesia, but she says, I was floating above my body, seeing you use this, and then you use that, then you had the saw, and then you had this, etc., like that. So she could, she could see these things, while outside her body. After the woman revived, she reported the details to her doctor. She's able to tell her doctor who came in and out, what they said, what they wore, what they did, all which was true. Right? So they knew this is true. The things that she saw, we have evidence that she could see something while her body was utterly unconscious. Number two, in another instance, a woman with a heart condition was dying at the same time that her sister was in a diabetic coma in another part of the same hospital. The subject reported having a con conversation with her sister as both of them hovered near the ceiling watching the medical team work on her body below. When the woman awoke, she told the doctor that her sister had died while her own recitation was taking place. The doctor denied it, but when she insisted, he had a nurse check on it and the sister had in fact died at the same time that, the, that she had seen her die in her out-of-body experience. So, there's evidence that people can see things out of their body and come back and prove that they, it was impossible otherwise than how that happened. Three. This is a great one. What about atheists who die and go to the spirit world? They don't believe in God. They don't believe in anything. Dr. Bruce Grayson documented perhaps one of the most compelling examples of a person who had an NDE and observed events while outside of his body which were later verified by others. The only way that these events could have been observed by the experiencers was in fact he was outside of his body. Al Sullivan was a 55-year-old truck driver who was undergoing triple bypass surgery in 1988 when he had a powerful NDE including an encounter with a deceased mother and brother-in-law who told Al to go back and tell one of his neighbors that her son with lymphoma will live. Right? <laughs> he could predict that guy is not going to die. Furthermore, during the NDE, Sullivan accurately noticed the surgeon Dr. Hiro, Hiroyoshi Takata operating on him was flapping his arms as if trying to fly with his hands in his armpits. When he came back to his body after the surgery was over, Sullivan's cardiologist was startled that Sullivan could describe Dr. Takata's habit of arm flapping. It was, <laughs> it was Dr. Takata's idiosyncratic method of keeping his hands sterile and pointing out uh, to surgical instruments and giving instructions to surgical staff. Like he put his arms in her hand, and then, you, you go over there. You go get that. I, want, I need that thing over there like that. Somehow the guy could see him doing that, right? That would be shocking if you're a surgeon. What if you were telling a joke or... Anyhow, so. Uh, here's one over. See, this is the atheist one. People have been clinically dead for several days. Listen to this one. George O. Denaya underwent one of the most extended cases of near-death experience ever recorded. Pronounced dead immediately after he was hit by a car in 1976, he was left for three days in the morgue. Can you imagine that? He did not return to life until a doctor began to make an incision in his abdomen as part of an autopsy procedure. Wow. Ouch! Uh, that would be pretty shocking if you were the doctor, right? Yeah! Stop that! Prior to his NDE, he worked as a neuropathologist he was also an avowed atheist. And there's several of these atheist stories where they saw God and then decided, I don't want to be an atheist anymore. Anyhow, so, so what happened was, oops, wrong button. Yet after the experience, he devoted himself exclusively to the study of spirituality. Taking a second doctorate in psychology of religion, he then became an ordain, ordained priest in the Eastern Orthodox Church. He served as a pastor at St. Paul United Methodist Church in Baytown, Texas, Rodinea held an MD and a PhD in neuropathology and a PhD in psychology of religion. He delivered a keynote address to the United Nations on the emerging global spirituality after he had been dead for three days. I think that's pretty interesting, right? There's one by a very famous atheist where he said he died and he, the only trouble is such a long story, it was hard to condense it. 
he said he saw, he, when he passed away, he left his body, you could see his body, and then he saw this bright, incredible, gleaming light of love that he called God. That's the other thing, they always find love on the other side, except the ones who go to hell. Now there's some who go to hell, and then they usually change, repent, and come back, and be nice. So might as well just be nice without a trip to hell first, right? Just be nice. Now this is an interesting one because my wife always asks, well what about if an airplane crashes and everybody dies at the same time? What happens to them? Do they all know? Listen to this one. A rare type of entity called group near-death experience is a phenomenon where a whole group of people have an NDE at the same time and location. This, this is for Suyapa. Yeah. They see each other outside of their bodies and have a shared or similar experience. In 1996, NDE researcher Arvind Gibson interviewed a firefighter named Jake who had a most unusual NDD while working with other firefighters in the forest. What makes it unique is that it happened at the same time as several co-workers were also having an NDE. During their NDEs, they actually met each other and saw each other above their lifeless bodies. So yeah, I guess if an airplane crashes, everybody sees each other and says, see you later, or whatever they say. They yeah, where do they go? All survived and they verified with each other afterwards that the experience actually happened and is described in a great way in Dr. Stephen Hoyer, May Hewlett's book entitled Fireweaver, The Story of a Life, a Near Death, and Beyond. Isn't that interesting? So if you want to read it, here's the book. And here's the website. So if you want to see the website, go here. Filled with stories, it has a whole section. What happens to atheists when they go to the spirit world? Or what happens to whatever? There's all, there's all kinds of things. Little kids, doctors. Many doctors who've had this experience come back and become religious, right? So anyhow, I thought this just interesting because Father tells us these things and I want to believe them, but where's the scientific evidence? We now have scientific evidence. Now, Father predicted that at some point, everybody's going to believe. Because these near-death experiences, you know how many people have recorded near-death experiences? 13 million people have so far. And they're writing books, and all kinds of books are being written, and YouTube. If you write NDE in YouTube, you'll see 100 YouTube stories there about people who've seen God, seen angels, seeing all these different kinds of things. So it's becoming overwhelming information that can be as they say, scientific evidence of the afterlife. I want to share this because we should pray and acknowledge the safe ascension of our brother and friend, Clayton Two Bears, who died last week. Right? Clayton, so again, here's Father's words. Ladies and gentlemen, the word death is sacred. It is not a synonym for sadness and suffering. Therefore, I have created a term called Sungma, or ascension, to explain the true significance of death. The moment we enter the spirit world is the time that we enter a world of joy and victory with the fruits born of our lives on earth. With the fruits born of our lives on earth. Our fruits born of our lives on earth, which are, is our sacrificial love for others. In every kind of case, whether it's charity, whether it's loving your wife, whether it's loving your kids, whatever the story is, we have love for other people. Witnessing stories, every kind of story we do that lives for the sake of others. That's, that's our treasure in heaven. It is time for those of us remaining on earth to send off the departed with joy. Be happy, Reverend uh, or Clayton Two Bears is going to the spirit world. It should be a time for great celebration. We should be shedding tears of joy instead of tears of sadness. That is the significance of the sacred and noble Sungwa ceremony. It is a first step to enjoying eternal life in God's embrace. The moment of death should be a time of greater excitement than that of a newlywed bride going to a groom's home for the first time. Never having been a newlywed bride, I'm not really familiar with that feeling, but I'm supposing it's a great feeling. And you know, here's two bears, right? Two bears would go pray with us. This was in Virginia. We had to go support the Women's Federation for World Peace Ceremony. This is in the Middle East Peace Initiative when we were going to the Middle East, to Jerusalem, to pray and be with people. Here's uh, Reverend Jenkins, Reverend Kwok, Reverend Young. I don't know everybody else who's there. Lots of faces. Marcus Vandymark. Antonio is there. Oh, where? Do you see him? Right next to Reverend Jenkins. Oh, is this Antonio? Yeah, that's Antonio. Ah, how do you like that? See? All one big happy family here. And uh, if you don't know, he was a tanker who landed at Inchon during the Korean War. 
This is him when he was a very young man. This is his training at Camp Pendleton. By was it Camp Pendleton? Yeah, Camp Pendleton. That's what he said. That's right. And uh, of course, this is Father setting little angels to pray for the spirits of our American soldiers who died in Korea. So you think little angels will be welcoming Clayton two bears into the spirit world this week? Absolutely, of course. Absolutely. Uh, here he is with us. We had a birthday party for Clayton. We loved them. They had a good family. We loved them. They, re they joined our church, in fact, with all our brothers and sisters. Joyful celebration. God bless them. This is just at our church. I don't know. This is, that was at our Christmas celebration. Here he is with uh, Master Sergeant Justin Harding. Uh, remember Fred Park was here. Suyapa, Yuriko San. I don't know who that is. Anybody have any idea? Oh, that's my, uh, and here's Matthew and Reina. This I think one? That's my mother in law. I, uh, oh, okay. Oh, could be. Yeah. Looks like. Okay, great. Yeah. And Yumiko. Yumiko san. Yumiko uh, Dunkley. Okay. Here he is again. Good close up there. This was uh, at one of our interfaith events in San Diego. They would come and support us all the time. Interfaith, loving people. Uh, that's a love kiss there. How happy they are. God bless them. This is them in regalia, total full regalia. He was Navajo, Navajo, and he was born on the reservation. He would say on the reservation, they were very poor, so he would, he would have to hunt rabbits for dinner. He would say his, his father gave him 122 bullet. Go get a rabbit, kid. So he had to be a very good shooter in order to do that. Anyhow, this is his application for the blessing. He did a pledge of uh, blessing ceremony. They were, they were blessed with us. Did all the things necessary to receive a, a true blessing. Uh, this was uh, Israel at the same time. Israel and Moss were blessed. And there they are now. Unfortunately, I need to call today. Or we, we should celebrate. I need to call to say Clayton has passed. Funerals planned for July 16th. I don't know any more details than that. They're planning those details now. But we should celebrate, love Clayton, everybody should pray. We say pray for a safe ascension for 40 days after to make sure he's protected during that, uh, during that ascension. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you very much. <laughs>